My name is uh, Paul Debevic and I'm the uh, Associate Director of Graphics Research at the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies and I do computer graphics research in the areas of uh, image-based modeling and rendering, uh, digital actors, and uh, very relevant to RTT and RTT Excite, uh, digital reflectance measurement. We're very happy uh, at the University of Southern California to have a collaboration with RTT. Um, it's great to publish research papers in the laboratory, but being able to work with the people who can get this so that it is impacting the world and becoming commercially viable, uh, you learn a lot from doing that and it can really broaden the impact of your research. You also will get to understand what's the next important problem to solve that you haven't solved yet, that people are struggling with, and that can be the next best research paper that you'll create. Uh, I was uh, uh, invited as a uh, guest speaker to uh, RTT Excite, I think uh, three years ago. And uh, at that point, I talked about some of the work that we were doing in um, uh, material acquisition in our laboratory, uh, 3D digitization. Uh, and uh, we realized that there was a big mutual interest in scanning uh, materials. So for the uh, last three years, we've had a collaboration, or I've been working with RTT, in developing what started as a research paper from the SIGGRAPH conference in 2003 on linear light source reflectometry and developing it into a commercially viable, fast, high resolution device that lets you take uh, the kinds of materials that you build a car out of or build a shoe out of or build a house out of and then digitize them in a way that you can put those into your computer generated scene and have all of the reflectance be faithful to what those real materials would look like. We use for the linear light source scanning, uh, some of the same related ideas as we do for facial capture, but we use different devices. Uh, for faces, faces are more um, you know, spherical and three-dimensional, so we need to put cameras all the way around the face. Uh, and we also end up putting light sources all the way around the head as well. Um, we build things called light stages, which are like geodesic spheres. There's a great uh, kind of geodesic-like structure in the background there. Uh, and we put LED lights at all of the uh, different locations. We make a full sphere of light and we turn on different light sources. Uh, and that's great for digitizing faces quickly. Uh, for digitizing materials, uh, they're actually harder than faces in some ways. Fortunately, they're often available as flat samples, and that's what we digitize in the linear light device. Um, but materials can have uh, anisotropic reflection, like brushed metal. Uh, when light hits it, it, it spreads in one direction, but it remains focused in the other direction. Uh, faces don't tend to do that very much. Uh, and things can get very shiny. Uh, things, you know, there's clear coat, which is, you know, perfectly impulse response function, uh, infinite frequency uh, detail in terms of the specular reflection. Thank goodness faces don't do that, uh, or else we wouldn't know how to digitize skin. The linear light scanner uh, uses a line of light and moves it across the material so that specular reflections just can't hide. We'll get every specular angle. Uh, it takes longer than to scan a face, but uh, it's okay to take you know 20 minutes. The sample's not going to go anywhere. We're uh, currently working, uh, um, my uh, colleagues at RTT and I, to figure out all the things that the linear light scanner is going to be good at. Uh, but we found that r right now it is great for metal samples. It's great for, for brushed metal, stamped metal, um, all the things that you would make, you know, various uh, accoutrements inside a car out of, it does a great job on. Uh, it also is very good for leather. Um, the bumpiness gets recorded very accurately. The color comes out very nicely. Uh, we haven't tried it on car paint yet, but we think it should do uh, get reasonable results on that. Um, it'll do okay on certain kinds of textiles. Uh, sequins that are sewn onto something can work out. Uh, shiny thread uh, can do well. But if something gets very fluffy or fuzzy, that's not going to be the best thing because we're assuming that there's a surface and that the light is coming from a surface. And predicting the reflectance from grazing angles based on seeing it from above is very hard for those more volumetric kinds of surfaces. So for that, I would recommend the more expensive uh, and slower scanning techniques of bidirectional texture function measurement. I started uh, getting very interested in computer graphics in the mid-1980s. 
And that's just when, you know, Turner Witted had made his uh, animation of, uh, you know, glass spheres floating over uh, plastic checkerboards. And people were very, very impressed at the time. I was impressed that, like, oh, it got the shadows right. Well, that's something that, you know, we hadn't seen before and it made it look more organic. But those kinds of things now look awfully synthetic and simplistic uh, now. If you look at the world of Avatar, it's still hard to wrap your head around the fact that every one of those trees and every leaf and every piece of bark and every one of those creatures and all the light and the, all of that is generated in the computer. It's a thousand research papers worth of invention and tens of thousands of hours of artistic uh, effort to create those kinds of visual effects. But we are now at the point where for a lot of scenes, you can create something that, that rivals the visuals that you can see in the real world and you can make it match to what you want to see from your own imagination. And it's always hard to get the real world to do what you want it to do. Well, right now we've been doing a lot of work on digitizing human faces. Uh, I guess you're aware of the Digital Emily project uh, that we were very happy to work on with image metrics, taking a real person's face and creating a digital actor version of them. We want to make that process a lot more efficient, a lot higher fidelity, and we want it to work in interactive in a game engine, uh, not just on pre-rendered imagery. And so there's a lot of interesting questions to solve uh, to make that work that we're working on. Well. Uh, one discovers pretty quickly, if you like synthetic imagery, that uh, it really is all about lighting. Um, you know, we actually don't directly sense the world around us. We just sense the light that's reflecting off of it. Uh, that's why you can create digital imagery and give people such an impression of these virtual worlds uh, just by showing them an array of pixels because we're so used to interpreting the world through our eyes which are, you know, in, in a some, somewhat advanced sense, just arrays of pixels as well. So simulating, you know, how bright every point in the scene is going to be is the result of all the complex reflectance properties in the scene and all of the amazing light transport that happens. It's not just from the sun to the surface to the camera, uh, but all of the uh, inter-reflected bounces that you'll get. There's specular reflection, diffuse reflection, subsurface scattering, transmission, translucency. Uh, all of these things vary throughout space and volume and create the beautiful lighting effects that you can see all around us. So if you want your digital imagery to have the richness of what you can see uh, in the real world, um, there's a lot of stuff to learn about and understand and it's all fascinating. <laughs>